Good evening. I'm Leland Vitter. Nice to be with you. Welcome to the program. President Biden ran his 2020 campaign on standing up to Vladimir Putin. Tomorrow, we find out if he has the chutzpah to back it up. Putin and Mr. Biden talk in 16 hours. Putin's army now stands ready to invade Ukraine at virtually any moment. The Russians now have 100,000 soldiers on the border with tanks and other heavy equipment, as you can see there, including aircraft ready to move on their weaker neighbor. Over the weekend, Russian fighter jets harassed a U.S. spy plane in international airspace. As if to make the point, the video you're watching right there was posted by the Russian military, not the American military. Ukraine is one of the most valuable former Soviet satellite states. Its mineral and coal-rich east would provide valuable hard assets to Putin's struggling economy. You can look there at the map, which is important. Crimea is the area the Russians have already taken from Ukraine. Donetsk, the Donbass, which is in the east, is the area that is contested. And you can see how Russia encircles almost all of the eastern half of Ukraine. In addition, its ports on the Black Sea allow Russia to project force into the Mediterranean. Plus, it fits nicely into Mr. Putin's desire to bring back Soviet glory and plays into his rhetoric, as he would call it, of a larger mother Russia. Important question, why should you care? Well, to start, treaty obligations require the United States to protect Ukraine's sovereignty. We made that promise when they gave up their nukes. Plus, a Russian invasion of Ukraine makes a move against NATO all the more likely. If that happens, U.S. troops would be forced to directly fight the Russians. Now for the political side of all of this. During the 2020 election, then-candidate Biden called Mr. P Trump Putin's puppet. I don't understand why this president is unwilling to take on Putin when he's actually paying bounties to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan, when he's engaged in activities that are trying to destabilize all of NATO. I don't know why he doesn't do it, but it's worth asking the question, why isn't that being done? Any country that interferes with us will, in fact, pay a price because they're affecting our sovereignty. We'll see tomorrow. Mr. Biden got high marks for his one-on-one -on -one in Geneva with Putin back in June, but things have changed since then. The Afghanistan debacle has badly hurt American standing around the world, and President Biden gave Putin a major victory by approving the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is allows Putin's cronies to sell gas to Europe. The Wall Street Journal explains the state of play around the world this way. Rogues are on the march around the world. Iran, Russia, and China are all seeking to establish new regional hegemony and they're often working together to do it. Their leaders don't appear to believe Mr. Biden can or will do anything to stop them. As opposed to the Geneva summit, Putin and the president will sit down via a secure video link to discuss their differences. So it's unclear how much of the conversation we will actually see, most likely very little, but the stakes couldn't be higher. Russian troops now sit ready to invade Ukraine with experts saying an invasion could come in January when the ground is fully frozen, giving Russian tanks and other equipment hard ground to drive over. Today, Jen Psaki said Putin will hear a strong message tomorrow. It's not about threats. It's about conveying that uh, the right path forward here is through diplomacy. Uh, in the meantime, uh, on financial sanctions, we've co consulted significantly with our allies and believe we have a path forward that would impose significant and severe harm on the Russian economy. Very similar threats did not work when Mr. Biden was vice president. I was in eastern Ukraine as little green men, a.k.a. Russian special forces, took over Crimea in some of eastern Ukraine. As you might remember, Putin's forces eventually shot down a civilian airliner, and Russia still holds Crimea. General Philip Breedlove was Supreme Allied Commander, U.S. Forces Europe, during Putin's 2014 invasion of Ukraine. He's since retired from the Air Force and joins us now. Good to see you, sir. We appreciate it. Um, all right. Uh, Putin versus Obama 2014. What lessons are there for Putin versus Biden 2020? Well, I think, sadly, uh, Mr. Putin was able to accomplish most of his objectives, uh, occupying Crimea, uh, continuing to support proxy forces and some of his support forces now in the Donbass holding that land. And what that has done is put great pressure on uh, Zelensky's government, 
and on uh, the rest of NATO who would like to be able to support Ukraine but sees that Russia has intervened. I really thought your book, Future NATO Adapting to New Realities, made some excellent points in terms of why this is important uh, for all of us. If, if you're sitting in Iowa or Nebraska or Kentucky right now, whether or not Mr. Putin invades eastern Ukraine seems pretty esoteric to care about. Why does it matter? Well, uh, Leland, uh, thanks for having me on, by the way. Didn't yeah, get a chance you. to say that. But um, so these are the way that wars begin. In our past, in World War I and World War II, the United States tried to stay out of these kind of skirmishes in Europe. And you see how that worked out. And so now we have a nation, Russia, that has used its military force to change internationally recognized borders twice since the winter of 13 and 14, when they invaded Crimea and then invaded the Donbass. And so the question is, can this behavior stand in Europe? Remembering that it started all the way back in 08 when they invaded Georgia and here still today occupy two big chunks of the nation of Georgia. Yeah, and, and it's not really a, a political left versus right thing or Republican versus Democrat, because it was then George W. Bush who allowed that to stand. Remember, he said that he looked into Putin's soul and thought that he could do business with him. We all know how that worked out. It seems pretty clear that NATO is not ready to go to war over Ukraine. Certainly doesn't seem like Mr. Biden is willing to go to war with U.S. troops over Ukraine. What up to going to war and putting American boys in harm's way, uh, does he have in the way of options that Putin would understand? So I would maybe cast those words a little differently than you did. What I would say is that it is clear that Ukraine means more to Russia than it does to NATO and the West. And that's why Mr. Putin is emboldened in his actions and frankly, uh, you know, pulls this, this gross, um, uh, assembly of forces to try to impose his will on not only the West, but the Zelensky government and Ukraine. And so what can we do? Well, we heard today that the president said that uh, he has worked with other allies and he has another series of, of uh, sanctions that he might bring on Ukraine. I am hopeful that if that is the path they choose, that this time truly the sanctions will have some effect. There's a lot of argument about whether Russia has been affected by our past sanctions or not. But what is clear is our past sanctions have not changed Mr. Putin's actions. Here he is again, readying to invade Ukraine if he sh should desire. Yeah, certainly he's not been forced to pay a price that has made him think twice or move in a different direction. So much of this is rhetoric, if you will, of, of what we hear from the president. And, and these world leaders both sort of speak to each other, both directly, as we'll see tomorrow, but also through uh, the media. It made me think of a, another president who had a different way of dealing with the Russians than the Soviets, uh, Ronald Reagan. Take a listen to him. So I urge you to speak out against those who would place the United States in a position of military and moral inferiority, to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. Evil empire, right and wrong, good and evil, on and on. And it seems as though when you listen, especially to the White House and particularly to President, Obama, Bi uh, President Biden, it's almost as if he views Russia and Vladimir Putin as a, a moral equal of some type. Well, <clears throat> I think that, that this is maybe a little older than this president. And uh, if you would allow me my opinion, and it's just my opinion, we have been backing away from leadership roles uh, in this part of the world for well over 10 years. Um, and as we back out of leadership roles in this part of the world, other nations like Russia move into them or assume more moral authority in these uh, leadership roles in this part of the world and are in their uh, own way are showing their strength and demonstrating their resolve where the West and others are not. And so 
I would take us back to maybe that first principle question of what is it that the United States and the West wants to do vis-a-vis -vis peace and the fact that we are not going to accept uh, armies, land forces changing internationally recognized borders in these spaces. And yeah. so maybe it's a decision that we have to make up front. Are we a part of the leadership team in uh, in this Western alliance I, I know you, that is I, being challenged? Yeah, we, we have you on, sir, because of how much we appreciate and admire your opinion. So that's not in question. But uh, scale of, of 1 to 100, what's the percentage chance that Vladimir Putin uh, invades Ukraine, say, before January 30th? So I'm going to dodge your question and say this. <laughs> Mr. Putin has assembled a capability. Yeah. He is known to use capabilities when he assembles them. Well, I he believe, and many others believe, that right now he has a limited capability. Uh, it, it may wait for harder ground. It may wait for additional forces, but it may not. Yeah. And so I think that rather than trying to predict what's in Mr. Putin's mind, because learned colleagues actually will tell you they don't know if he knows what he's going to do yet. He's going to wait and see how these consultations play out. He's going to wait and see how people react. Now, but the you... fact of the matter is Mr. Putin has built a capability. Yeah. We have to respect that capability. And as you point out, um, when America has stepped back in the past, dating all the way back, to World War I, things have uh, not worked out. Uh, Philip Breedlove, former Supreme Allied Commander, it's good to see you, sir. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate the perspective. All right, President Vladimir Putin, of course, is not the only bully trying to change the power dynamic. We are learning more now about China's plans to build a naval base on the coast of Africa. You can see there in Equatorial Guinea. Communist Beijing would then have their first ever base on the Atlantic Ocean. And the base would allow Chinese warships to rearm and regroup just a few thousand miles away from America's east coast, not to mention their ability to cut U.S. shipping lanes with Europe. So far, the Biden administration hasn't really done much to stand up to China's military moves or punish them for their genocide and unthinkable human rights abuses. But today, the Biden administration announced their big move. The United States won't send the first lady or diplomatic delegation to the Winter Olympics in February. News Nation's Kelly Meyer joining us live from D.C. And we need to point out that the first lady and a diplomatic delegation doesn't go, but the athletes still do. Kelly? That's right. And the move from the U.S. has really struck a nerve with Chinese leaders. To them, it's a blatant disregard for their government as well as the Olympic Games. And it has officials vowing to take, quote, firm countermeasures against the U.S. Chinese leaders saying everything here from the U.S. wasn't even invited to calling the boycott, quote, a blatant insult to the spirit of the Olympic Charter. Here's the warning from Chinese officials today. And Leland, the de facto newspaper of the Communist Party of China tweeting today, quote, to be honest, Chinese are relieved to hear the news because the fewer U.S. officials come, the fewer viruses will be brought in. Yeah, and the Biden administration is taking it on the chin both ways, right, from the Chinese, but also from the American press corps that seems, shall we say, less than impressed with this. Yeah, reporters have been asking the administration uh, for weeks what they were going to do here about the Olympic Games. Uh, now the question is, is this boycott going to do anything to impact what's happening in these human rights abuses in the region? Uh, sources I've talked to on both sides here say that the administration has to take a tougher approach here, uh, take more aggressive action against China. And there, the U.S. isn't really dialing up pressure against China here, but here's the White House defending their measure today. Not sending a U.S. delegation sends a clear message that we cannot conduct ourselves with business as usual, that we are not in a state where business as usual is appropriate at a time where there are human rights abuses that we have been outspoken about. And as you mentioned, Leland, the White House, they are sending, they are not sending U.S. Uh, delegation. They are not sending any official representation, but the athletes will still be able to compete, but they're going to have full security with them. You have to wonder how much that good that full security will do if the Chinese decide to, uh, do something untoward. Kelly, thank you very much. We appreciate it. With that, we bring in 
Former Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, Robert Wilkie. Good to see you, sir. Uh, just thinking about this, is there anything more feckless than a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics? Well, I, I don't think that uh, the, the hard men in Beijing really cared much if the vice president or Mrs. Biden came. What they do care about is corporate America funneling money into their regime, and they care about their face to the world. Uh, this is the minimum that this administration could have done. Uh, it's not going to affect the Chinese and their behavior. What would send a message, and I agree with Senator Cotton about this, is if the world's leading sporting power said we are not going to give credence to a regime that has one million of its own citizens in concentration camps and is, is murdering thousands every week. Yeah, you think about what the Chinese really understand, which is the money and hard currency as they deal with things. And there's a degree that matters of prestige. You think about where their investments are around the world, uh, especially with this new possible naval base on uh, the Atlantic. Uh, invested $2.96 billion in Africa last year, up 9.5% from 2020. $3 billion in Africa buys a whole lot, but they've invested $8 billion over the past 15 years uh, in the Caribbean. That's even closer to home. Uh, th that's exactly right. They're, they're moving in ways that the Soviet Union could never do. And, and our response has to be a, really a repeat of the, the policy of containment that came to, to full flower under Ronald Reagan. But we have to start, again, spending on our national defense. This administration is spending the lowest amount of our GDP since the end of World War II. Our Navy has been run ragged. Uh, we are losing ships because they're just worn out. And we have to once again approach the blue water and then take again command of the skies to send the Chinese the message that we sent the Soviet Union. We have the ability to push you back into your territorial waters. Even if they do uh, establish a, a base in Equatorial Guinea, we can, we can close blockade that and make sure that they, they don't create a great deal of mischief. But it takes hard decision making and a worldview that I don't think this administration has. Going back to that worldview, even Jimmy Carter understood what the Soviets' language was. He boycotted the 1980 Olympics and held back yeah. U.S. athletes. That meant at every moment during those games, it had to be said that America wasn't there. It just hung over the games like a real stench and embarrassed Moscow. Uh, is that something that had the Biden administration boycotted these games in Beijing that would have had the same effect or a bigger effect? Well, I think it would have a bigger effect on the Chinese psyche. They are very different from the Russians in that they believe that as a nation that has suffered, particularly in the last three or 400 years, um, grievance after grievance, um, that their ambition is to present a new face to the world. And if the world's leading power uh, chooses to ignore them, and chooses to boycott uh, their their most important ceremony, uh, then that would have created a ripple through the Chinese uh, government, the likes of which we could not do with the Soviets. To bring this full, full circle uh, from where we started the block, which was uh, with this conversation that Biden and Putin are gonna have tomorrow, uh, the president and the president of Russia. If you, I'm, I'm beginning to think that Vladimir Putin, had he seen today an announcement that the U.S. would boycott the Beijing Olympics. He would have a very different interaction with President Biden tomorrow than seeing that we are not going to boycott it. Instead, the First Lady isn't going to go. Oh, absolutely, because a boycott would have also included the removal of billions and billions of dollars in support to the regime in Beijing. That meant Coca-Cola and McDonald's and a whole host of them uh, would not be able to participate in that. And that would have sent shockwaves. Um, so Putin would have uh, done something that uh, he would not be used to doing, and that would be taking Mr. Biden seriously. Mm -hmm. You started your program by saying the Wall Street Journal was right. The hard men are marked because they don't take uh, Mr. Biden and his administration seriously. Yeah, and the longer you don't get taken seriously, the bigger action you have to take to begin to be taken seriously on the world stage. I learned that um, with four years in the Middle East. Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you, sir. Thank you, all, as always, for the uh, perspective. Always good to see you, Leland. Yeah, pleasure's ours. Georgia's gubernatorial election is starting to heat up. We're a year away. Will the new swing state be a test? and we're learning why it might be for the future of the Republican Party. Plus, 
New York City's first in the nation vaccine mandate. Will it stick or is this Bill de Blasio's chance to be an MSNBC contributor? We in New York City have decided to use a preemptive strike to really do something bold to stop the further growth of COVID and the dangers it's causing to all of us. Okay, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, three weeks left in office, and today he announced what he calls a first in the nation vaccine mandate. It's going to require workers at all private businesses in the city to get the vaccine. Now, it's going to have to happen in the next 21 days, and there is no testing option. Well, why the next 21 days? Well, de Blasio just has a little less than a month left in office. He says the stricter rules are needed to fight the Omicron variant. But the far left mayor is now brushing off concerns about lawsuits over the latest mandate and confusion over the mandate that's going to expect affect 148,000 businesses, children ages 5 to 11, required to show proof of vaccine before being allowed to enter restaurants, fitness centers, or entertainment venues. And get this, two shots, not one, will be required. So People have to go get the shot literally in the next couple of days if this holds. 90% of New Yorkers already have gotten at least one COVID shot. Many are still holding out. Chris Hahn, host of the Aggressive Progressive podcast, joining us now. Chris, we wanted to have you on because you uh, are a vocal proponent of vaccine mandates. So you had to be doing cartwheels when you saw him on Morning Joe, right? Well, it's funny. The guy's been mayor for eight years. The only time he wakes up early is when Morning Joe calls him yeah, in to talk about something. So at least there's that. Uh, I do like vaccine mandates, and I do agree. We should have vaccine mandates. But, you know, when you're in your last three weeks of May as being mayor of the biggest city on the earth, uh, maybe wait and let the other guy evaluate this. It's really going to have three days. It goes into effect on, on December 27th. He's got three days left in office there. But, look, I agree with the concept. I think we should be mandating vaccines for all sorts of things. And local governments do have the authority to mandate yeah. things for health and safety reason, reasons in a way that the federal or even sometimes state I, can't. So let's think, I agree let's with think about policy. why, though, why now, which we have to ask, because he could have done this over the past six months. He could have mandated it, say, for riding the New York City subway. There are all things he could have done. Why do this on Morning Joe when you're a lame duck mayor? So I, I have two things, and maybe you can add to this. Either he wants an MSNBC yeah. contributorship, or this is for his ad for when he announces running for governor? I think the latter. Okay. Uh, I think he could easily get an MSNBC contributorship. They love him over there in the, in the morning Joe green room. Um, but the man does think he's going to run for governor. I think it's delusional. Uh, I think he'll come in sixth place in a five-way race. Uh, and, and you know me, I'm a very progressive guy. Yeah. Uh, I just think that uh, the city of New York did not do well under him. It's not all his fault. There are other factors involved, including a global pandemic that was beyond his control. But, uh, you know, he, got, he inherited a city that was booming, that was riding very high. And uh, it's, it's a shell of what it was when he took office. So I don't, I don't see how uh, a, a gubernatorial run is a realistic option for him. Uh, yeah. But, you know, who knows what he's going to do. Th this, is, this is his, one more soundbite from him on the impact of the mandate. Take a listen. And, and this would be my advice to mayors, governors, CEOs all over the country. Use these vaccine mandates. And the more universal they are, the more likely employees will say, okay, it's time. I'm going to do this. In a way, though, he's really sort of handing a, a big basket of you know, burning you-know-what to uh, Eric Adams coming in, there's going to be lawsuits over this. There's going to be massive confusion over this for employers, for how you're going to enforce it, how the city can enforce it. What a mess. Yeah, look, it's only going to be in effect for three days when Eric Adams gets into office. So he's going to have to evaluate the legality of it. I think it is legal, frankly. I don't think there's anything wrong with the city of New York doing it. 92% of New Yorkers in New York City have adults have the vaccine already. So we're actually in a pretty good place in New York City, which is why there haven't been any deaths from COVID in New York City in three days. New York City was the epicenter of this pandemic when it began, and it has really turned the corner on COVID because New Yorkers have taken the vaccine and many mandates that are in place already in New York City very seriously. 
Yeah, so, well, also, I mean, you yeah. can't go out to dinner in New York City without showing your vaccine card. As we understand it, though, you can go uh, in New York City to one of those safe havens for smoking crack and heroin without your vaccine card. But we'll leave it, uh, we'll leave it there, Chris. It's good to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. And let me be very clear. Over my dead body, will we ever give Stacey Abrams control of our elections again? And he's running, and a new candidate comes out swinging in Georgia's governor's race. What David Perdue's announcement means for the current Republican governor and the Republican Party, plus the parents of a school shooter charged. What about the school officials who let the kid back into the classroom before he killed some of his classmates? We're back with that. These charges are intended to hold the individuals who contributed to this tragedy accountable and also send a message that gun owners have a responsibility. New fallout now after a Detroit area prosecutor filed involuntary manslaughter charges against the parents of 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly. Crumbly's accused of shooting and killing four of his classmates at Oxford High School last week, wounding several others. Police say school officials met with Crumbly's parents on the day of the shooting to warn them about disturbing drawings and statements from the boy. But since he had no prior problems, he was allowed back into class. Now, the prosecutor is not ruling out filing charges, not only against the parents that we've seen, but against school officials. Did the school have legal grounds to search his backpack and his locker? Yes. But they didn't? It doesn't, no, I, I mean, we, we don't know exactly if that weapon was in his bag, where it was. We just know that it was in the school and he had access to it. And he was allowed to stay in school. Philip Turner, former federal prosecutor, now criminal defense attorney joining us. Uh, seems as though the parents behavior in this is pretty egregious, but the school is not without being ridiculously, I don't know if reckless is the right word, but certainly uh, they did, didn't really follow through on this, did they? Well, they were, you could say they were negligent, I think, uh, negligent. And I think that's where some lawsuits will probably come, some civil lawsuits. And, of course, generally for um, municipal and schools, it's uh, willful and wanton conduct generally. But there will be some lawsuits. I, I, I doubt that there will be a criminal prosecution of the you know, someone at the schools. Of course, um, obviously, there is a prosecution of the parents, and that is certainly uh, very appropriate, in my opinion. One thing, and I, I agree with you, and that you know they were, there was text messages to the to the parents uh, and the kids saying, "Oh, don't right. get caught looking at ammunition!" Ha ha ha. The parents clearly knew that they exactly. had a troubled son. If there's a school shooting, and they're texting, "Ethan, don't do it." On and on. Okay, but you listen to what the prosecutor right. had to say, and the Michigan Attorney General also also send a message that gun owners have a responsibility. It almost sounds like the DA is launching a, a run for Congress on a gun control uh, platform. Well, uh, I think this is certainly a clear message to gun owners that there are laws in the books, and really there's no need for any additional laws, but that these laws are going to be applied to you now. And I think that probably there are a lot of parents and a lot of people who own guns who immediately ran and said, I'm going to put my gun in a gun safe, and then I'm going to take that safe and put it in another safe, and then I'm going to put chains around it with locks on it that maybe I can get into because I don't want to go through that. And uh, this certainly sends a shot across the bow to all, all those people that, no, you won't just be sued. Uh, you may go to prison. So uh, people are going to say, wow. And it's no new statute. It's not calling for any new statutes because these are the statutes that are there. And that's what the prosecution is using. I, and, only got, um, I, only got about I, I only got about 15 seconds. But you think about it, kids do a lot of bad things for, you know, over the weekend, Correct. kids rampaged through downtown Chicago. They beat up a bus driver. Right. There's a lot of people say, well, shouldn't yes. their parents be charged too? Well, it, it, well, it, it, there's obviously some factual differences, but certainly um, you could, if you wanted to try to prosecute them, you could try to do so. Although obviously there are some factual differences with yeah. the parents obtaining the gun and, and leaving it around. 
you know, here the, the kids just are let out on the streets, you know, just let loose to basically rampage the streets. So there's factual differences. Yeah. But, you know, I think that you might see some prosecutions like that because in order to try to deter people and in order to send a message to parents that, hey, you better stop watching your, watch as you, your well, kids. As you, as you now, rightly the point parents out, may only, beat those charges. As you rightly point out, it only takes one or two that there's an example made and people start uh, changing their behavior. Right. Good to see you, counselor, as always. Thanks. Right. Okay, thank you for having me. I'm running for governor to make sure Stacey Abrams is never governor of Georgia. To fight back, we simply have to be united. Unfortunately, today, we are divided, and Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger are to blame. Former Georgia Senator David Perdue jumping in Georgia's governor's race primary challenge. He's going to challenge incumbent Republican Governor Brian Kemp reigniting a real civil war inside the GOP. Former President Trump attacked Kemp after the November election, claiming that Kemp didn't do enough to act on his very questionable and dubious claims of election fraud. Mr. Trump narrowly lost Georgia to President Biden in 2020. The firestorm over that election hung over the January runoff Senate elections, which happened to both be in Georgia. Purdue ended up losing to Democrat Senator John Ossoff. Then Senator Kelly Loeffler, a Republican, also lost to Senator Raphael Warnock. The results ended up giving Democrats control of the Senate. And now all of this circles back to the governor's race. Democrat Stacey Abrams is running against Kemp again. She lost in 2018, but Abrams claims that the election was stolen from her. Georgia Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, a Republican, the only guy not being accused of stealing anything in the, all these races, joins us now. Good to see you, sir. Uh, Good to see you. All right, is David Perdue the guy to uh, unite Georgia Republicans? David Perdue right now is the person that reminds us about this synthetic divide inside the Republican Party. I mean, it's just crazy to watch these self-inflicted wounds continue to pop up. I mean, I say synthetic divide because if you lined up Republicans right now, we may never have been more in agreement of the policy positions of the party. We just, for some reason, wanted to fight about the personalities of the party. Uh, and uh, that's painful to watch happen. I guess it's part of the process of getting ourselves back in, back in charge of the White House and the Senate and the U.S. House. President Trump uh, has been a big part of this, obviously, sometimes on the sidelines. Now he's jumping in. Wow, it looks like highly respected Senator David Perdue will be running against Rhino Brian Kemp for governor of Georgia. David was a great senator, and he truly loves his state and his country. This will be very interesting. Uh, I know you and the president don't agree on a lot, but uh, will this be an interesting race up to the primary? Well, we actually do agree on a lot. We're, I believe in conservative principles and support a number of the policies that he passed over those four years. I just don't believe the election was rigged, uh, and I'm, willing, I'm not willing to go on camera and lie about it. Um, look, I, I'm not certain what happens. I know Donald Trump loves the spotlight, and he's going to certainly try to play that up as much as he can. Uh, I know he wants to stay in, in, in favor. Uh, he's got a better chance of hitting a hole in one at Mar-a-Lago than he does being president again. So, look, I, I hope we dig into what the policy positions are. And uh, that, to me, uh, lines up with Brian Kemp. This, this is a conservative state here in Georgia. Uh, yeah. all, all eight statewide constitutional officers and the, and the majorities in the Senate and the House. Um, and, and Brian Kemp's done a great job being a conservative. Where do you, let me ask it this way. Do you worry that this primary fight, which is going to be a fight to the death unless one of these guys gets out between uh, Brian Kemp and David Perdue, does that lead to the real possibility that Stacey Abrams uh, in four years later becomes the governor after the 2018 narrow loss? Yeah, it certainly does. I mean, think about it. If we got to devote all this attention in, in tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to the primary process over the next five months, not worried about the real opponent, right? The person that if Stacey Abrams was in charge of Georgia the last three years, I can't imagine how long it would have taken our kids to get back to school. We wouldn't have $6 billion in a rainy day fund. Our unemployment rate wouldn't be at 3%. Uh, this would be real problems for Georgians. And so I want to focus on the real opponent in November, not have this, you know, political civil war here in Georgia, just because we want to see your name on the top of the newspaper. I, I always admire your candor, but it seems as though neither side is willing to give in this. And you're sort of the reason, most reasonable Republicans are, are caught in the middle and certainly not the loudest voice in the room. 
Well, I think we just got to be a steady hand. A lot of folks ask me about GOP 2.0, you know, describe it in 10 seconds or less. And I just want to be the adult in the room uh -huh. and just really champion conservative policies and, and do it with a better tone. Because I think, honestly, at the end of the day, that l aligns with the majority of Americans. They want a steady hand that can make big decisions when it counts and let them go live their lives and raise their families. And, and to me, that lines up with conservative principles that I stand for. You got me excited when you said 10 seconds. That was more like 15 or 20. We'll leave it there. I was close. I was close. <laughs> you were. You, you were, and you're always a good sport. We're glad to have you. It's good to see you in, in a refreshing perspective, sir. Great to see you, Leland. Yeah, all the best. Actor Jesse Smollett took the stand in his defense today, what he said about the alleged hoax hate crime. And we want to thank you at home for helping to make News Nation the fastest growing cable news network. Tell us what you think on Twitter at Leland Vittert. Welcome back. Jesse Smollett says it wasn't a hoax. The disgraced actor says he was actually the victim of a hate crime. He's charged with staging an anti-gay racist attack on himself in Chicago back in January of 2019. And he took the stand today in his own defense. You might remember at the time wide-ranging outrage over the alleged attack that he said was carried out by supporters of President Trump. Smollett's story fell apart when the Chicago Police Department investigated and found two Nigerian brothers who knew Smollett and said they were paid to fake an attack as a publicity stunt. Joining us now, Karen Conti, legal analyst, founder of Conti Law, litigator here in the city of Chicago. Uh, all right, boy, do I wish there were cameras in this courtroom for not, not only Jesse Smollett's direct, but the cross would have just been great. Absolutely. Whenever you have an actor on the stand, you know, they're, they're usually pretty good and pretty convincing. And the, the prosecutor is one of the best lawyers in this country. So it really would have been fun. And I'm not quite sure why the judge did not allow the cameras in the courtroom, because, as you said, this case had a very rocky start. And transparency has always been a problem in Chicago, as it has political corruption. Yeah, you, 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 could, you might say that. Uh, Mayor Daley had, uh, had a unique view of how things worked in this city. Uh, the two brothers who told police Smollett paid them to stage the attack, they both testified to this. And now Smollett's trying to spin this story that it is some kind of weird love triangle or something involving this. Is it just, is this a defense or is this just a Hail Mary that one juror holds out? Well, who knows what the truth is? And unfortunately, we're not in the court. We're not judging credibility. But it's very likely that he had an affair with one of these brothers. I mean, they were hanging out together. They were doing drugs together. They were admittedly going to bathhouses together. I don't know about you, but bathhouses to me means there's some sort of romantic or sexual uh, liaison. So that doesn't surprise me at it's, all. It's not, something I could, it's not something I could accurately comment on, but uh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, your point's well, well made. Uh, I, I guess yeah. th this, is, this would be the question, though. What... Based on as you're reading Smollett's testimony, and uh, at one point he's saying he's getting advised during this whole thing by Don Lemon of CNN and on and on. I didn't call the police because I don't trust the police, yet he left the noose on his neck so the police could see it. There's nothing in this testimony that seems to really go to, gee, I was actually attacked. Well, remember, Smollett has not gotten to the meat of his testimony yet. He spent a lot of time on the stand today talking about his background, how he came from a poor background, how he worked his way up. And the purpose of that is to get the jury to like him, to know him, to understand him, to kind of connect with him. Because we all know as trial lawyers that if the jury connects with a defendant, it's really hard, uh, or at least harder, to convict a person. So we, we don't know what the story is. It's all going to be done tomorrow. Tomorrow's a big day for Smollett because he's going to have to explain what the heck happened here. So what is the key moments that you're going to be watching for tomorrow? I shouldn't say watching, but reading the transcript for. He is going to have to, he's going to have to explain uh, the notes. There were notes that were left uh, in emails. What, what did they all mean? Why, what, what, if this wasn't a hoax, then, then why are the Asandero brothers testifying against them? Are they motivated by money? Uh, were they trying to save their own hide? Because you recall, they were actually arrested by the police initially, right. and then the police arrested Smollett. So uh, again, all of these things are going to have to be explained bit by bit. All right. Karen, we appreciate it. we got to run. We'll uh, talk to you in the coming week as uh, the testimony continues. Good to see you. Good to uh, see you, Leland. Take care. All right. Tonight on Prime, Jesse's brother, Jojo Smollett, joins Nicole live, 9 p.m. Eastern. And 
Coming up, proof that you can be the world's richest man and still have a bad day when we come back. All the money in the world cannot keep you from having a bad day. And the richest man in the world learned today that is true. Tesla shares off 20% from their all-time highs amid news of a new investigation into the car maker. The Security and Exchange Commission is looking into whistleblower complaints about solar panels the company sells and their new questions about the autopilot self-driving system, including whether or not they faked some of the promo video. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration is looking into that. Full disclosure, I have a Tesla on order. I'm only slightly bitter about the fact that they are 10 months behind when they first promised the car. We bring in Chadwick Moore, a man never bitter about anything. Uh, Elon Musk flying a little too close to the sun these days? Uh, you know, yeah, there, well, there was this huge story in the New York Times that came out today about all of this auto um, autopilot features on the car. I mean, firstly, I think we should have been expecting a hit piece in the New York Times to drop any, any day now because uh, Elon has been a little too um, mean to uh, their political ideology, perhaps. Uh, but um, it also kind of reeks of this other big Silicon Valley story. Not quite as much, obviously, because Elon's actually successful. But uh, the um, Elizabeth Holmes case, she's back in, uh, uh, that's been back in the news recently. Uh, she was, of course, the CEO of uh, Theranos. And it, it just kind of reeks of this, uh, this, this, these young Silicon Valley newcomers who want to disrupt an industry and really kind of maybe fly too close to the sun. They promise things that they just expect will eventually get done and will be easier to accomplish than they actually realize. And then some problems start to come in and uh, starts to uh, make the company uh, look a little bad. Yeah, well, the, the, difference, the difference with the Elizabeth Holm case, though, perhaps, is that Elizabeth Holmes's thing never worked. Theranos never worked. Therefore, she's charged with fraud. Elon Musk is delivering cars. SpaceX is delivering astronauts. There's, there's things that are actually working. But you bring up a pretty good point. Uh, never get in a fight with a man who buys ink by the barrel. Is Elon Musk now in a, a fight with the New York Times? I don't know. He's, I was just looking at his Twitter account, and he's been pretty silent about it all day today. I mean, we'll see what, what happens with that. Uh, but the New York Times, I don't think, likes him very much, and hasn't for a long time. Uh, so I think that this hit piece isn't really surprising coming out. Uh, there, you know, most of it tra traces things back to 2014, 2016. There's not a lot of very, very new stuff. The solar panel, panel news uh, just broke today. Uh, and uh, yeah, the stock is not doing so great, but Elon hasn't really been talking about it from what I've seen. And maybe he will just, I don't think it's necessarily like him to just ignore something like this. I imagine he will punch back at the New York Times, uh, but we will have to see. Well, yeah, the SEC wasn't very happy with some of his tweets uh, in the past. Chadwick, it's always good to see you, my friend. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Tomorrow, my we're going to break down President Biden's big meeting with Vladimir Putin. Does he speak a language that Putin understands? That's tomorrow. Dan Abrams is next. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.